the COVID-19 pandemic has changed a lot of things and how we view society. What it has also done is given us this opportunity to bring you an interview with Professor William Mazzarella, who is uh, literally sitting across the world from us and is in a different time zone. But it is the digital mode that has allowed us to have this conversation with him. Uh, as uh, many of you already might know, he writes and teaches on the political anthropology of mass publicity, critical theory, effect and aesthetics, psychoanalysis and ritual and performance, and the occult shadow of the modern. His books include Shoveling Smoke, Advertising and Globalization in Contemporary India, Sensorium, Cinema and the Open Edge of Mass Publicity, The Mana of Mass Society, and with Eric Santner and Aaron Schuster, Sovereignty Inc., Three Inquiries in Politics and Enjoyment. He is also the co-editor with Raminder Kaur of Censorship in South Asia, Central Regulation from Sedition to Seduction. It's an honor to have him here. We welcome you, Professor Mazzarella. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you know, to jump straight into the conversation, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about populism and you have you know, sort of described it as a slippery concept in the sense that it's difficult to define and, you know, used to describe very diverse phenomena. Uh, with the rise of the present regime in India, as well as, you know, the past regime in the US, uh, the long established academia in India have in some sense seized on the term to make sense of a reality that many had clearly not anticipated. Uh, this bewilderment, if we can actually use the term, is a state that afflicts academics worldwide. Uh, now, you suggest that these days populism is a word that we reach for when we can sense that the possible, uh, there is a possible breakdown of, you know, the liberal sentiment, uh, the so-called liberal settlement. Could you please elaborate on this particular question as well as, you know, take the conversation a little forward? Sure. Um... I think that your mention of surprise, your mention of this sense of a bewilderment is really key to understanding what's going on in terms of, I think, academic uh, grapplings with, with populism, whatever that is. Um, and I kind of uh, came up with this notion of the liberal settlement in order to think about precisely this um, academic surprise, this academic be bewilderment at the rise of populism worldwide. So basically what that means is that um, my argument is that, you know, the social sciences had kind of divided the world up uh, notionally into zones that were supposedly liberal democratic zones, basically the global north, uh, and zones that were supposed to be, uh, you know, illiberal zones or zones that were incompletely liberal or incompletely democratic or whatever, basically the global South. Uh, and so one of the reasons why the, the rise of Trumpism in the United States, uh, the Brexit referendum in the UK in 20, both of them in 2016, as well as the rise of new kinds of authoritarian and uh, populist intolerant illiberal politics in many parts of the Euro-American world was such a surprise uh, to academics is that I think that they had been operating all along with a kind of assumption that this kind of thing uh, was going to happen elsewhere, but it wasn't going to happen in the global north. It wasn't going to happen in the supposedly liberal democratic world. So when they say that uh, the liberal uh, settlement is coming under pressure, uh, right now, what I mean is that uh, especially white middle class academics are having to deal with the appearance in their own backyard uh, of phenomena that they thought were kind of safely ensconced in other parts of the world. And in having to deal with it, they're having to reckon with the fact that these forces are in fact not new, neither in other parts of the world nor in their own parts of the world. So it's also a confrontation with, uh, as it were, repressed or disavowed aspects of liberal democracy in the West, uh, in the global North. So I like to say that, uh, and I was particularly pleased to hear you refer to the Trump regime as a former regime. That felt like a big relief to have it described that way. Um, uh, I, I tend to say that, you know, if 
Trumpism has done us any favors at all, then it might be to have disclosed these kind of illiberal currents that had always been there, but that uh, many people had been conveniently able to ignore up until the point when we actually had a regime that put them front and center. Right, uh, thank you. You know, uh, so in your writings, you've also talked about the fact that, uh, you know, when uh, it is surprising that anthropologists now uh, get surprised by the fact that, uh, you know, by the rise of populism, uh, because uh, methodologically, uh, and if not always ideologically, uh, anthropology itself tends towards a populist stance, you know, working in the field, engaging with the common sense of the common people, and taking popular ingenious uh, ingeniousness uh, into account so and then you know you go on to argue that anthropology has all along studied populism even if it was not described as such and uh, the changing nature of anthropology's predicament you contend is that and i'd like to quote you here uh, where you write how uh, but now in so far as we face the problem of analyzing and explaining the current populist wave the wavering of the liberal settlement means first that we are no longer able to sustain the fiction of an actually existing na normative liberalism against which the difference of our informants life worlds can be measured and second that the project of making anthropology more relevant to public debates about the political present present can no longer if we are seeking any real intellect intellectual yield latch onto a tacit liberal shorthand uh, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about this tacit liberal shorthand here. Yeah, I think that um, we all pretty much know what that means. I mean, it's things like the presumption of secularism in public life, the, uh, the presumption of a kind of um, deliberative rationality in how politics is conducted. Uh, and, you know, in a, in a more sort of popular register, I guess, the presumption that public life is about kind of, um, you know, tolerance, decency, all of that, right? And, you know, when I say these things, obviously, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with tolerance and decency. We all like tolerance and decency. But, but what I mean is that by tacit liberal shorthand is that I think that there's a convenient way in which anthropologists and social scientists in general have been able to explore the kind of illiberal practices of people in other parts of the world by framing them as culturally different, right? So then what happens when those things show up at home? And why is it that we get so angry and so bewildered and so confused when those very things show up in our own backyard, right? So that's the that's the kind of um, the bewilderment that I, I was trying to address in that article. And in doing so, also pointing to the way that there is a kind of paradox. And that's the, that's the passage that you were quoting, right? That there's a paradox in the fact that on the one hand, anthropologists have been saying for years that, you know, this kind of liberal democratic thing is a kind of Western construct and it's a, you know, it's a kind of ideological fiction. And yet, in their own attempts to gain any kind of traction in public discourse, they've been relying on this, these very same kind of norms in order to uh, put across anthropological insights to a broader public. So how do we deal with that contradiction? And I think that the, the decisive moment in the United States with the rise of Trumpism was that anthropologists suddenly realized that the tolerance that they'd been extending to informants or collaborators or interlocutors in other parts of the world, they were not feeling like they were able to extend to say white working class uh, neighbors down the road in the United States. Why not, right? So that discloses that there's a kind of ideological presumption of a liberal norm at home that when it's violated, creates a problem. But when it's, uh, you know, when people behave in that very same way in other parts of the world that you may study, you treat it with a kind of 
tolerance that is premised on you know the predication of cultural difference so what i was trying to point to there is a kind of paradox or a kind of i don't know hypocrisy is a very strong word but um a kind of inconsistency or contradiction in the way that um anthropologists and maybe some other kinds of social scientists too have been grappling with these kinds of uh, forms of uh, illiberal politics of course, uh, having stressed the surprise of many uh, anthropologists, I also want to say that at the time when Trump got elected in the United States, uh, many non-white anthropologists were saying, there's nothing surprising about this at all. You know, we've known this has been like the everyday for non-white populations in the United States always. So why are you so surprised? So there's also a question of class and race in here you know, that should be addressed. Right. Uh, thank you for that answer. You know, so since we're talking about populism and then here in India as well, populism is something that, uh, you know, people have been constantly talking about in the past few years. And in that context, we also talk about the role of the media. And one of the reasons uh, we suggest that Indian media has had a significant role in the rise of populace, uh, populism is the change in both the scale and nature of uh, the Indian media. So you now have WhatsApp videos uh, which circulate so quickly and so widely, and they have a very uh, critical role in reaching out to those who may not uh, well be reading, right? And uh, likewise, uh, in mainstream media, there has been uh, the increasing use of a, a vernacular tone. So we might be exaggerating the role of the media, but uh, we would like to hear your views on this. Right. So, um, as you know, when you first sent me questions, this was one of the ones that I kind of uh, pushed back on a little bit. And I was trying to clarify for myself also where my own sense of um, discomfort with the question was coming from. And um, I think, you know, there are a couple of things that I would say. I think you're right, of course, that we need to consider the role of, of uh, media in the formation of any kind of public life or any kind of uh, politics. Uh, it's not just populism that is, uh, has some kind of particular hand in glove relationship with, with new forms of media. Uh, these days, you, you, know, you can't do politics without some kind of uh, mobilization of, of the media. But the second kind of question, I guess, uh, would be, well, I really, I think I have two other kinds of uh, points about this. One is uh, what counts as a medium, right? Like, do we know what we mean when we say the media? I think very often, you know, people uh, think, well, you know, it's obvious, it's television, it's uh, social media, it's uh, the internet, it's radio, it's cinema, whatever. Uh, but I think it raises a bigger question, which is, what are the forms through which our public life and our forms of um, political identification and, and um, activation, what are the practices through which those are mediated, right? And in some cases, those, that might be the kind of things that we call the media in the kind of ways that we've just been talking about. But in some cases, it might be other sorts of things. It might be language, it might be ritual. It might be uh, forms of everyday life, right? So for me, the question is really the mediation of uh, political life through social practice, through forms of social practice. And some of those forms of practice are what we refer to as the media. But I think in some ways it can be artificial to separate off the media from broader forms of uh, social mediation, let's say. Uh, that, that could take forms that we don't necessarily recognize as the media. Then the other thing I would say about this, and this is less of a kind of um, uh, pushback to your question and more maybe a different way of engaging it. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I think that um, while of course it's important to pay attention to the specific affordances of any particular medium, and it, it's, it's definitely true that each new kind of medium raises new kinds of possibilities and new kinds of uh, problems and new kinds of anxieties. It's also always the case that the emergence of each new medium, you know, going back hundreds of years has raised similar kinds of anxieties. 
right? So we only need to look at, for instance, like a hundred years ago, uh, the rise of the cinema. Let's take the case of India, right? Uh, there were similar kinds of anxieties about that, right? The similar kinds of anxieties about how this was reaching people in a kind of, as you say, vernacular way, that it was inciting unruly affects, that it was going to lead to irresponsible forms of public behavior, that it was going to create, uh, you know, that it was going to give rise to like mob behavior, that it was going to incite violence. So, you know, these kinds of uh, anxieties about especially audiovisual forms of mass mediation are not new. So my question back to you in a way would be, what is it about the current configuration of specific forms of media? Like, let's say you mentioned WhatsApp, you, you, you mentioned, we, I'm sure, uh, any forms of social media and, you know, the proliferation of new kinds of television channels and all that in India over the last 20 years or so would also be significant, I'm sure. New idioms of um, news casting, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff, all of that is real. What is it about the relationship between the emergence of those forms and perhaps the uh, specific forms of national politics that we see now under the Modi regime that is distinctive? That would be, that would be uh, you know, my question. You know, my friend Arvind Rajgopal uh, published a book um, about 20 years ago called Politics After Television, right? Which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, in which he made an argument about the, uh, the relationship between the rise of commercial television and kind of uh, neoliberalism, consumerist neoliberalism in India in the 80s and 90s, and the consolidation basically of Hindutva, right? This was the, the core of his argument. And I wonder if there's a kind of equivalent sort of uh, exploration that could be made about the relationship between Moditva and social media. Maybe, you know, uh, I've not been following these things in the kind of granular detail that would allow me to make, make that kind of argument. But I think the, the, the question I would ask in response to your question is, um, what actually are we anxious about in our questions about media, right? Is it about um, losing control of uh, like a centralized dissemination or um, of messaging? Uh, that's what that seems to be one thing that is an issue when we talk about things like the rapid circulation of WhatsApp messages. You don't know who they're coming from. Tweets are retweeted. There's a kind of uh, sense of uh, a kind of loss of structure, a loss of control. You don't know who's speaking. Uh, people don't need to speak in their own voices. They can use avatars. They can use usernames. Uh, they can hide behind other people's communications and recirculate them, right? So there's a kind of anxiety about like, where is the public sphere? Who is the public sphere? Who is speaking, right? And maybe this is something that is distinctive, especially to digital media and to forms of social media. And, and that would be an interesting thing to explore for sure in relation to the present. But then I think, as I was saying with the example of cinema, and you can make the same uh, arguments about uh, many other media over time and their emergence. Uh, there are anxieties that are very old and that are kind of repeated every time, you know, new medium comes into the picture. And those anxieties do tend to be anxieties that are about, um, you know, losing the decency or the rationality of the public sphere, right? Like the rise of forms of, uh, of uh, public affect that are perceived to be dangerous, that are perceived to be illiberal. Uh, of course, uh, during the rise of the cinema in, in India, uh, that was during the colonial period. And so the anxiety was inextricable from the project of um, colonial mastery, right? Uh, and it had all kinds of racialized overtones as well, right? So there were arguments that the British colonial authorities were making in those days that were basically the claim that there was a kind of natural affinity between the excitability of the cinema and the excitability of Indians, right? But then uh, after the colonial period, many of these same anxieties continue to animate, you know, the governmental project of the post-colonial state and its attempt to master and control the way in which media um, functioned. So, 
Yeah, so that's my kind of like roundabout series of responses to your question, uh, uh, more or less in the form of, uh, you know, questions that I would ask you. Uh, so actually, we have also been thinking about it in terms of what new has the media added to you, the conversation. Uh, I would say that there has been a sort of communicative abundance in the sense that there's too much information out there. There is equality of access, but then there is inequality of knowledge. So in that sense, it's very difficult to understand what is fake news, what is not. A general sense of mistrust in everything that the media shows or the media you know, puts out is out there amongst everybody, be it the liberals, the leftist, or the right wing. So each of these camps sort of don't trust any of the media channels, any of the media outlets of the other camp. So in that sense, there is again a sense of mistrust, which was probably not there at least, you know, maybe 15 years down the line, where if there was something in the news, the first question you did not ask was, is this a fake news? So that is actually the first question that even today, even we are thinking. Before sharing anything, we're confirming whether, you know, uh, it's uh, fake news or not. So that is something which is very, very new to sort of say, then the public participation, like you said, in the public sphere has been very varied, very huge in the sense that uh, now you have a lot of anonymous bots, trolls also on social media talking to you from different parts of the world and you don't even know whether they're real or not. So perhaps Dipali would also like to add something. Right. Uh, no, in fact, you know, I think uh, whatever you've mentioned here, uh, Professor Mazarella, I think it's a combination of everything. And then I see it at two levels, right? Uh, so one, uh, you know, when you lock, uh, talk about, uh, you know, the big media houses and the channels, etc. I feel uh, maybe earlier, uh, there was scope for, you know, uh, media houses, uh, you know, with different affiliations to exist. But now that has... Uh, uh, that is not the case. So most of the major, you know, media uh, houses and the channels that are there on the tele television are constantly, uh, you know, you, you would watch the news and you know, they're all talking about the same thing. Some might be arguing uh, the same thing with more uh, rigor, you know, with a lot of vigor, but uh, the question of, you know, the questioning of the government probably is not there. So you have uh, all the channels uh, just, uh, you know, uh, agreeing to whatever the government is saying or just uh, putting it out there this probably was not the case earlier and second i feel with the uh, you know um, uh, social media applications such as whatsapp there is a lot of data which goes uh, you know to uh, i guess uh, the government and uh, the big corporations so what you know what are they doing with it and there is a lot of surveillance there so i see it like that as well so this drastic shift from what was there previously uh yeah your question deeply yes or your comment okay yes, please. uh so I, yeah i have two thoughts uh really about what you were saying uh one is that uh yeah we talk about fake news now it's like fake news has become a a kind of uh, global slogan, right? And we experience ourselves as being in a kind of moment of radical uh, cynicism and, uh, and uh, doubt about the veracity of anything that is reported in the media, right? Uh, but I think that there's a, a little bit of a distortion in this way of thinking about it because uh, what it tends to do is to produce this idea that somehow before everything was true, and everything was reliable, uh, you know. And in fact, uh, really, if you think about the Indian scene, um, between uh, the very first experiments with television in India uh, and the rule out of Doordarshan in the 1970s, um, and then the gradual commercialization of Doordarshan and then the rise of the private channels in the 90s and the 2000s, you see a transition from a situation in which uh, the government had a iron clad control on the content of, uh, of television and radio, uh, Air, All India Radio and Doordarshan, uh, to a situation in which uh, basically corporate advertising controlled what could go uh, in the media. 
So the idea that television or the mass media had ever been independent in the kind of way that um, we might like to uh, idealize, you know, as a kind of uh, independent and critical public sphere, I think is a bit of a romanticization. And so to speak of fake news now, I think on the one hand recognizes a, a new kind of intensified uh, suspicion and paranoia, but on the other hand, tends to overestimate the, uh, the integrity or the kind of freedom of the public sphere or the reliability of the public sphere before the moment that we're in now. So I think we have to like think stereoscopically about this. Like we have to think critically about the present without idealizing the past, okay? So that would be, that would be one response that I have to this. The other thing that I would say in relation to your comment is that um, what you're describing in the present is a situation which is paradoxically characterized simultaneously by uh, consolidation of media control, right? You were saying that, um, you know, now uh, there is no independence, everything, like no one basically contravenes the government, you know, it's all everyone's falling in line, like there's no diversity of opinion. And on the other hand, a kind of unprecedented proliferation of media channels. Uh, and I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, formal media channels, but of course also the internet, which uh, allows for a kind of uh, access or participation or multiplicity that couldn't even have been imagined, you know, 30 years ago. So, so how to make sense of that combination of a kind of centralization, consolidation, uh, and fragmentation at the same time? One way in which, of course, people have thought about it is precisely in relation to the kind of thing that you were talking about around surveillance and data mining, right? So the fact that uh, the internet now reaches everyone in very kind of like apparently customized ways is also part and parcel of a data mining project, right? Where like we're all being algorithmically subjected to ever more fine-tuned versions of ourselves, basically. Um, and I think there's all kinds of interesting things to say about that. I'm, I tend to be kind of skeptical of the sort of um, doomsday scenario uh, narratives about this. Uh, like, for instance, there's this book that came out a couple of years ago called Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, by uh, an author called uh, Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, and she paints a very kind of totalizing, kind of um, melodramatic, I would say, picture of the, uh, you know, the implications of this kind of um, surveillance-oriented, data mining-driven, uh, internet-mediated democracy, right? Uh, you know, I think that, um, Part of what's problematic about this way of thinking about it is that it confuses the ideology of a kind of uh, total control, which is, of course, what like all the Silicon Valley dudes and the marketing people would like us to believe that their technologies are like intric so intricate and so sophisticated and so able to, to uh, bring us the most exquisitely tuned version of ourselves through like algorithmic perfection. It confuses that ideology with uh, the actuality of how people actually come to the commitments and the desires and uh, understandings that they have, whether as consumers or as citizens or, or whatever. For one thing, I think it's actually, um, I think our relationship to the idea of being perfectly understood by an algorithm is fundamentally ambivalent. Like on the one hand, uh, of course, we want, you know, the algorithm to understand us as well as possible, right? Like we want us, like the, the things that we really want to be marketed to us, we want the websites that we actually would be interested in to be, uh, you know, in our, in our feed as recommendations. We want Netflix to tell us exactly the movies that we really would want to see, blah, blah, blah. So there is a kind of, you know, uh, flattery, actually, even in the idea that the algorithm could bring us like the perfect version of ourselves. On the other hand, there's a kind of panic in there. 
And I'm not talking about the panic just about the idea of being surveilled or, or of like losing privacy or somehow becoming a, uh, you know, your whole self becoming like a product for a corporate capitalism. I'm talking about a, a kind of existential panic, which I think is, you know, the other side of the idea of being fully recognized by the algorithm is that there would actually be no difference between you and the algorithm anymore. Right? And at which point do you cease to exist? Right? Is our, is our like ability to experience ourselves as acting subjects in the world actually premised on a minimal difference between us as we experience ourselves and the things that we encounter, right? Whether it's the internet, other people, the world around us, right? So I think there's both a kind of uh, desire and a dread built into this idea of like uh, being fully interpolated by, by the algorithm. I talk a little bit about this in this book, The Mana of Mass Society, that you were kind enough to mention earlier. Uh, you know, finally, of course, I think there is a question of what's happened to journalism uh, in, in the current moment. Uh, my good friend Dominic Boyer uh, wrote a book a few years ago called um, uh, now I'm going to embarrass myself by blanking on the actual title of the book. But anyway, the book was about news journalism in the uh, age of the internet. And he, his fieldwork was done in Germany. And uh, one of the things that he was talking about is how these days news journalism is really a kind of curatorial rather than a kind of writing project. That journalists who used to actually be reporters or who used to actually write articles are now sitting at their computers watching the feeds of material coming in from elsewhere, recombining it, repurposing it, repackaging it, uh, because not only is there a 24 hour news cycle, so everything is constantly changing, but also everything is moving so quickly that there's no actual time to write anything anymore. Right. So there's also this way in which like the very temporality of news production has shifted in the age of the Internet. So, you know, uh, I think all of this has some relevance to the question of um, what we expect from the public sphere today, right? Uh, and what we expect from journalism and what we expect from our encounters with media. Right. Uh, well, thank you again for that answer. I think you've put it uh, uh, there so clearly. So, uh, you know, now I'd like to take your uh, attention to this question of advertisements, because that is, again, something uh, uh, we've been uh, seeing a lot lately, right? And uh, in your pining text, uh, Shoveling Smoke, uh, Advertising and Globalization in Contemporary India, uh, you've, you know, since that time, a lot has changed in the country since you wrote that book. But perhaps the point that you've been arguing about uh, effect and mass media was uh, were as central to commercial advertising in the heydays of a globalizing India as it is in the surge of populism today. So, and you suggest that uh, any social project uh, is not imposed through force alone and it must be affective to be effective, right? So have dominant approaches in the practice of the social sciences failed to grasp the affect and thereby the surge of passions we witness today? Uh, that's my question to you. Well, um, you know, my short answer is yes. Um, but then the question is, you know, why? And um, I think there are a number of reasons. One is that academics tend to identify with a kind of liberal pedagogical ideal, which is about kind of rational discourse rather than about um, affect, right? And so they tend to downplay or be uncomfortable with the affective dimensions of social life and by extension of scholarship. Um, so that's one thing. And I think another dimension that's related to that is that um, the attachment to expertise uh, in uh, scholarship and in the academic world is in a sense also an attachment to control over fixed forms, fixed forms of knowledge. And so that attachment is very uncomfortable with um, something as mobile and volatile uh, and emergent 
as kind of the affective dimensions of social life. So one symptom of that is that I think a lot of social science is, has a hard time dealing with questions of becoming, right? Uh, there's a kind of desire to have fixed forms of knowledge to express knowledge in, in terms of a language of structure, right? Whether it's the structure of a culture or the structure of institutional forms and to see like affect as something that is just destabilizing of structure. Now, my actually, funnily enough, my inspiration in, in all this is very unfashionable. Uh, I know that affect theory, of course, in the last uh, 20, 30 years in like cultural studies and cultural theory and, and critical theory has, of course, been a big uh, current. And uh, there's a kind of, um, uh, there's a kind of excitement about sort of new theoretical frontiers uh, around questions of affect and so forth. But I would, I would argue that actually questions of affect are right at the heart of the, you know, the grand tradition of social theory. Uh, so for instance, uh, take Emile Durkheim's uh, theory of ritual and his notion of collective effervescence. That's a theory of affect. That's a theory of how affect is uh, completely fundamental to the functioning of society. Uh, and in fact, I would go further and to say that Durkheim's argument in uh, the elementary forms of religious life is simultaneously an affect theory of society and a semiotic theory of society, right? This idea that the totemic system is a kind of sign system uh, through which um, society organizes itself, makes itself intelligible to itself, but simultaneously that uh, this sign system, the totemic system, can only be animated by people coming together and experiencing intensified states of affect uh, in uh, ritual settings. So this to me is actually, you know, of course Durkheim frames it as a description of um, what he calls so-called primitive ritual, right? But he also implies in the elementary forms that these same ideas are relevant to understanding modern politics. And so my own project in uh, the book, The Mana of Mass Society, was actually in large part, or certainly a big part of that book, is to pick up on this uh, suggestion of Durkheim's and to say, uh, you know, what would it actually look like if we were to take this uh, proposition about the relationship between collective effervescence and signs and to apply it to modern politics? and to apply it to things like advertising and to marketing. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that on the one hand, yes, there is a kind of, uh, and, and I would say, especially in a lot of mainstream political science and political theory, which are usually the uh, disciplines through which something like populism is discussed, right? Uh, there's a kind of reluctance to deal with the affective dimension of the social or uh, I like to, uh, sometimes I like to call it the energetic dimension of the social, um, or even the, the demonic dimension of the social. Um, there's a kind of reluctance in mainstream uh, political science and political theory to, to engage with these things. But I think we have the resources at the very heart of, you know, classic social theory uh, to, to revisit and to rethink these problems. You know, it's not some kind of strange newfangled idea. It's like, it's right there in the tradition of mainstream sociology. Um, but again, you know, there's a way in which, uh, you know, sometimes theorists now or uh, anthropologists, sociologists also get kind of blinded by what I would call a kind of primitive settlement. So they presume that these kind of like affective dimensions of things pertain to non-Western societies or to, uh, to you know, other forms of social and cultural organization, but not to the, you know, the li so supposedly liberal democratic forms of uh, Western politics. But I think even Durkheim 
you know, who was by no means a kind of ecstatic social theorist. Uh, you know, he was really in many ways like a kind of sober rationalist. Um, even he was saying like, this is absolutely fundamental. The affective dimension is absolutely fundamental to, um, and has to be to any kind of collective life, whether it's, uh, you know, so-called primitive small scale societies in the language of that time, or it's, uh, you know, large scale modern mass mediated democracies. All right, right. So again, you know, from Durkheim to Weber and speaking about uh, be it small scale or large scale societies, charisma is again something that pervades all kinds of societies. However, we often use the term, in fact, you also say that it's used as, to describe moments when something, you know, sublime seems to emanate from them or shimmer through. So in the Indian context, that has been sort of true in, you know, not just the present times, but also previously. So uh, would you want to comment on the role of the media in creating a pool of charismatic leaders? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that in a way, the more interesting question is what we mean by charisma. And uh, in you know, a sequitur to that question could be like, well, are there specific ways in which particular kinds of media sort of enhance or uh, sustain uh, charisma? Very basically, as you were suggesting in that quotation, I think that um, we all know what charisma is, right? Like we all have a kind of, uh, intuitive personal sense of what we mean when we say so-and-so is charismatic or uh, yeah, we know what that means, right? We've all been around it in one form or another. It's that experience of something charged that appears to uh, emanate from a person or from an object or from a situation. Charisma can also be a feature of things. It doesn't have to be a feature of um, of, of people, uh, you know, it can be what Walter Benjamin called aura, for instance. Um, so we all have a sense of it, and yet we all struggle to find a way of talking about it, because it seems like it's almost like um, so unpalpable, so um, evanescent, you know, uh, it seems like it's a kind of invisible power. And the other thing that I think is really interesting about the notion of charisma is that it's, it's kind of amoral, right? Like uh, we attribute charisma both to people that we see as problematic, manipulative, um, maybe um, despotic. Uh, we think of charismatic leaders as being, you know, uh, crowd stirrers, as using like the force of charisma to bring about unreasonable or um, dangerous forms of political behavior. Uh, we think of the classic examples of fascist leaders, of, you know, crowd psychosis, all that kind of stuff. We associate that with charisma, but we also think of charisma as the property of uh, those, let's say, teachers or those political leaders who have made a revolutionary difference in society or in our lives, right? Like that they have some kind of ability to bring about something that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So it seems to me that when we talk about charisma, we're, we're talking about a, an ability to activate, to actualize something uh, in the social environment or in a person. Um, but one word I like to play with in this regard is the word provoke, uh, provocation. Because actually, etymologically, what provocation means is a calling forth. Right? So if you think of uh, charismatic, 
force as a kind of provocation. It's the ability to call forth something, the ability to uh, make something emerge. And that is, um, that opens up onto a very different way of thinking about what social life is. Like if we think of social life not as being uh, fundamentally about, let's say, uh, you know, structures of meaning or institutional forms. I mean, of course, it's about those things too, right? But if we don't start from that point, but if we start instead from like, what are the moments in which, which, which something is called forth? What are the moments in which something is activated? What is the moment in which something comes to matter intensely? comes to uh, be experienced as a kind of intensified occasion of significance um, and value. Then we're talking about charismatic moments, right? And those, sometimes those moments are ritualized, sometimes those moments happen spontaneously. Uh, and you know, when Weber talks about charismatic authority, his point is that charismatic authority is a kind of anti-structural authority, right? He has that ideal type of three types of authority. There's traditional, there's legal bureaucratic, and there's charismatic, right? And both traditional and legal bureaucratic are about like stability of form, whether it's like traditional because that's the way we've always done things. We continue to do things that way. It's stable or it's legal bureaucratic. It's the rule of law, you know, it's also stable. But charismatic has this quality of something that bursts forth out of the stability of form that is not itself about form, but about the sense of something being activated or actualized. So for me, I like to think about these things dialectically, right? I like to think about social life as being constituted through some sort of dialectical oscillation between uh, form and, uh, and emergence, right? charismatic activation and like structural form. I realize I haven't answered this question in relation to your question about media at all, but that would be the question that I would pose if we're thinking about this in terms of media, right? Like what is it about a given medium that allows it to have this activating force, right? That allows it to call forth something. And what is it also about that medium that then allows it to structure what it is called forth in a certain way, right? To give it a certain kind of form. Another kind of language that I've used to talk about this relationship between kind of activation and form in the past has been incitement and containment, right? And I think that in some ways, if we think about media, it can be useful to think about it as a kind of dialectic of incitement and containment. Like energy is being incited, affects being incited, enthusiasm being incited, attention being incited. Uh, and then on the other hand, contained, mediated through a particular kind of form or a set of discourses uh, or a set of, you know, institutional norms or something like that. And that being a kind of constant back and forth in social life. So rather than answer it as a, in a kind of uh, normative way or in a kind of uh, evaluative way, I would say like empirically, you know, what is going on? Right? Like, if we take a look at any given situation, can we make sense of it in terms of a kind of dialectic of incitement and containment? Right. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for that answer. And then, you know, we've come towards the end of this interview. So, uh, we thank you, Professor Mazarella, for taking time out to do this interview. And you have so eloquently, you know, helped us understand some of these uh, words and concepts which have constantly been uh, or constantly being used now, I think, in India very much so, as well as globally. And, you know, uh, the role of the media and also taking us through ideas of uh, populism, charismatic leaders, etc. And how you've talked about the importance of context. Right. So, uh, I am sure our viewers uh, who are interested in the field and uh, you know who interested in your work would definitely watch this and take a lot from uh, this conversation that we've had today. So we thank you again for taking time out and uh, 
yeah, we really uh, look forward to reading more from you in the future. Thank you, Dipani. Thank you, Ritupanna. Um, thank you so much for tolerating my ramblings. Uh, it was really a pleasure to be uh, given the occasion to talk to you. No, the pleasure is absolutely ours. And I would actually suggest young go back to the classical text and read them again. Because as you can see from this conversation, there's a lot to take from them, be it Durkheim or Weber, to actually understand even what seems the contemporary. So yes, don't forget to you know read the classical text. Uh, thank you, Professor Mazzarella, once again for sort of you know uh, taking time out to do this across the globe. Thank you.